be here and also to see your lab starting up at Berkeley doing really interesting work in machine learning and healthcare. Um, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about some work I've been doing sort of in the, over the last, say, four months, um, essentially around predicting, trying to understand and predict how molecules smell, um, which is, at least when I first started, I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist, um, I, my training is, or my current training is in computer science and math. So it, it really struck, it struck out as a very interesting sort of unique problem to work on. Um, I think coming from like more protein design problems. So it was, it was pretty interesting to me. Um, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you guys will also find it interesting. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the work we've been doing, trying to build models that can sort of predict how molecules smell by understanding sort of the underlying biological mechanisms of olfaction, which is broadly just the study of smell. Um, and yeah, as uh, as Ahmed had mentioned, this is work done as an intern at MSR. Um, and yeah, we'll get started. So uh, starting off, olfaction is uh, probably the least understood um, among all senses. Um, we, we've had deep learning bring enormous gains in digitizing and understanding vision, understanding hearing, and, and models for vision and hearing are deployed across the world um, uh, and, uh, and across dozens of different applications. Um, and even going more simpler than that, we have very, very well understood maps for color, um, say RGB, where different combinations of red, green, and blue can produce unique colors. Um, we have similar sort of digitized maps for hearing so with frequencies, uh, but we don't really have a similar map for smell. Um, so here on the left, you see this sort of early color map from nearly a hundred years ago. And when you think about sort of what makes a good digital map of some sort of sense, uh, with, with a color map here, you can see that similar points that are in the neighborhood of an individual point are likely to have similar colors, right? Uh, and the same goes for RGB. Um, and ideally what we'd like to see for odors is some, some kind of odor map where if we have some latent space uh, condition on molecular structure, um, similar molecules in this latent space should have similar odors. Um, and so this is kind of the motivation of this work of, can we start to build sort of an early step towards creating a digital odor map um, by understanding the fundam fundamental mapping between a molecule structure and its underlying odor? Um, and why is olfaction or, or smell important, um, even to start off? Like why work on this problem? Um, I think some of the reasons I found it very interesting is it's incredibly tied to so many different systems in the human body. Um, for example, your sense of taste uh, isn't just a, a, a function of the taste receptors on your tongue. Um, it's also a function of the smell receptors in your nose because you'll often have air sort of while you chew come in through your mouth and enter the nasal cavity. And so your sense of smell is actually governing whether or not you like a, a, a specific food. Um, uh, in, another example is memories. Um, oftentimes, having a smell of a unique food immediately sort of brings back memories from your childhood. Um, and so you can unlock these deeply rooted memories that are tied to unique smells. Um, on the healthcare side, um, olfaction has been really, really useful in diagnostics, for example. Um, people tra are training dogs to detect Parkinson's because it's been found that some Parkinson's patients emit these unique volatile organic compounds. Uh, and there's also a lot of open questions around olfaction and healthcare. Um, a really good sort of recent example is COVID. Um, one of the biggest symptoms of COVID is, is the loss of your sense of smell. And it's something that's still poorly understood. Um, so there's a lot of different verticals and a lot of interesting biological problems um, that you can start to answer by studying olfaction. Um, and what, what, what I found most interesting when I was learning about olfaction for, from the beginning is sort of how closely it's tied and governed by proteins. Um, our sense of smell works essentially due to these 400 olfactory receptors that each human has. Uh, when you smell your morning coffee, um, you base, what's actually happening is you have a group of odorant molecules that enter your nasal cavity and activate a combination of unique olfactory receptors. And essentially the combination of unique olfactory receptors that get activated by a group of molecules is what gives your brain a unique signal 
that you perceive as a unique odor or percept. Um, and these olfactory receptors essentially line these hair-like sort, of, uh, sort of fragments on the cell lining uh, called cilia. Um, so essentially you have these olfactory sensory neurons. Each olfactory sensory neuron expresses a unique olfactory receptor, one of 400 in your body. Um, and you have over a million of these olfactory sensory neurons um, in a small patch of tissue called the olfactory epithelium. Um, and so when unique receptors essentially get binded to by an odor molecule, they send signals to something called the olfactory bulb, where essentially each group of olfactory sensory neurons that express the same protein will all collect in a single bulb or, or olfactory glomeri and send a unique signal that gets goes straight to the olfactory tract, which leads to your brain. So it's, again, one of the few um, verticals for uh, signals that go straight to your brain, um, which I think is very interesting. And even more interesting to me was that based on this sort of uh, very sort of abstracted model of how smell works, um, there should be a way for us to give it an input molecule without even knowing the intricate details of all the system, systems involved, be able to, by understanding what receptors get activated, be able to predict how that molecule smells. Uh, and so a brief outline of what I'm going to cover for the rest of this talk is I'm going to start off by talking about, uh, I, I just went in very briefly into the biological underpinnings of olfaction. I'm going to spend some more time talking about sort of the motivation of sort of our work and how this fits into the field of olfaction. I'm then going to talk a little bit about some existing work that studies uh, molecules and their odor responses and say, work that's being done to, say, on the protein ligand binding side of understanding how molecules bind to unique olfactory receptors. Um, I'm then going to talk about some of the work we've been doing to curate new data sets for using machine learning in olfaction, and then some of the models we've been building to model both study both olfactory receptors and the odor responses they trigger, um, and then show some downstream experiments that we've been using, running with the models we've trained and some overall takeaways. And so the broader motivation of this talk is essentially, can we understand the underlying biology between the mapping of a molecule to the olfactory receptors it activates to the underlying percepts or smells that it triggers? Um, and so to understand essentially how our sense of smell works, we need to first understand how a unique molecule in some latent space uh, triggers and activates some subset of olfactory receptors, some uh, say subset of say 10 or 400 olfactory receptors. And we then, given that information, need to figure out how those receptors in combination activate a unique or so, sort of trigger uh, a unique signal, which we perceive as an odor or a percept. Um, this problem is incredibly hard because oftentimes multiple molecules can activate the same receptor and multiple receptors are activated by the same molecule. So there's no one-to-one -one matching here, really. Um, it's a very like, combinatorially complex problem to work on. Um, and so to make things even harder, um, the field of olfaction is incredibly nascent and new. The, the Nobel Prize for actually characterizing the sets of genes and, and in general, the, the code for olfactory receptors and sort of the early work for the olfactory system was only awarded in 2004. Um, and yeah, this was work by uh, Richard Axel and Linda Buck um, uh, that won the Nobel in 2004. Um, and we have very little structural information about the proteins themselves that code for olfactory receptors. Um, and so if we're thinking about what type of mapping we want to learn, uh, we know that there exists around 400 olfactory receptors in humans, um, which is way more complex than say the three types of cones you have in your eye um, that code for unique colors, for example. And so you, you have some subset of odorant molecules. You want to understand which olfactory receptors they, they activate. Say for molecule number one, it activates olfactory receptor one and three. And then given that information about both the structure of the molecule and the olfactory receptors it activates, you want to be able to predict the underlying odor it triggers. Um, and sort of going back to my earlier point, we know very, very little about olfactory receptor structure. Uh, for context, the first human olfactory receptor structure was only uh, crystallized experimentally and published in Nature at the beginning of this year. And it was a lab at UCSF, um, Ashish Monglik's lab that did this. So we know very little about structure. And yes, we have alpha fold, but 
how much can we really trust models like AlphaFold um, when we have, when AlphaFold has very little training data about structures that belong to olfactory receptors, right, is a natural argument. Um, and so here you have sort of a, a PDB or, or 3D structure of the, uh, the olfactory receptor they crystallized, um, and it's bound to the, this fatty acid molecule called propionate. Um, and one of the early points I'm going to make that we'll sort of carry out later in the talk is this idea of locality in trying to understand how a unique odor and molecule interacts with the receptor. Um, it's this idea that even if you have a huge protein with many different chains, uh, the interaction between a unique odor and molecule is, is really only happening with a couple of residues in a small, in a, in a, in a specific chain. So say this olfactory receptor is around 300 amino acids, there's really only about say six or seven residues that are actually making contact with the molecule. Um, and so this is sort of an interesting way to think about the problem and trying to model it. Um, say, how can we use methods like attention to tell us which residues to attend to? And I'll talk a bit about this down the line. Um, and yeah, so this is kind of a, a more simplified version of you can see that when in the center you have your fatty acid molecule propionate and you have sort of a subset of about six uh, res key residues that are actually uh, having interactions with this molecule. Um, and to make this problem even harder, um, humans perceive the same molecules very differently. Um, even single sort of amino acid changes or mutations in a human olfactory receptor can cause very, very drastic changes in odor perception. Um, so there's a, a paper there's a paper from Hiroshi Matsunami's lab. Uh, at Duke back in 2007, where they profiled the specific olfactory receptor, OR74, and they showed how one single substitution at a single residue uh, of 133 from T to an M caused large subsets of the population to perceive a molecule known as androstenone, which is one of the molecules in sweat, to not be smelled as sweaty, but to find sweat pleasant. Um, so you have these very, very drastic changes Say so in trying to build a model that can predict how a molecule can smell, um, you can't really just go take that molecule and then predict how it's going to smell without accounting for the fact that these receptors have sequence variation. Um, and that also has to be studied. And so that was a big motivation early on. Um, and I'm going to talk about existing work that makes starts of that um, and where we try to add on um, in our work. Um, to ratify that even more, there's another paper um, from 2019 where they profiled the olfactory receptor 56A4. And they basically show that if you ask a large sort of uh, human, you set up a large human trial, you get them to rank a bunch of molecules in, in uh, basically from most to least pleasant. Um, and different groups of the sort of the trial have different haplotypes um, or essentially sequence variation at a specific sort of subsection of this receptor. And you can see that, um, Basically, these these small changes to say a couple of residues in a in the specific receptor cause very drastic changes in the rank of how pleasant say isovaleric acid is seen. Um, and isovaleric acid, for context, is a very sort of sulfurous, very very like stinky smelling molecule. Um, and so, again, sequence variation is very important in understanding this problem. And humans can perceive molecules very differently. Um, and so. All of this sort of is motivated not just by obviously learning the biology, but using our understanding of the biology to build a digitized map of smell. Um, given an input molecule, we'd like to predict, um, and we'd like to be able to create an easily searchable index of scents. Um, it, it, because for example, if we can build a model that can do this, we can screen through billions of molecules in large catalogs to create new materials, design new synthetic odorants, um, and say, for example, solve very important health problems like designing an anti-mosquito repellent for malaria. And, and so there's a lot of interesting problems beyond designing novel fragrances, which are probably going to be the first sort of beachhead or, or sort of approach that people are going to use this kind of work for naturally. Um, and so mapping molecules to, what makes mapping molecules to scent agnostic of the olfactory receptors that govern scent, govern scent even harder is that it isn't purely a function of structure. Um, so the, the natural first approach here, um, for a compu if you're a computational chemist, is you will take in these molecules, you will encode various information about that molecule's structure, such as the weight of the molecule, the number of hydrogen bond donors, the different functional groups in that molecule, and you'll try to use that to create some meaningful decision boundaries around different scents. Um, but you can see in this very trivial example with Lyral that the molecule that smell that is structurally very similar to it has a very different odor profile. 
profile, whereas a molecule that is pretty structurally different from it has a similar odor profile. So there are structural discontinuities here. Um, and so in solving this problem, uh, a, 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 a lot of our interests turn to using graph neural networks. Um, and this is mainly because of the huge foundation of work in geometric learning and graph neural networks in re learning representations of molecules. Um, and I'm going to give a brief, brief overview of why this community uses graphs as inputs to our neural network for these problems. Um, so when you have a molecule, a graph is a very native representation for representing a molecule. You can think of each node as an atom and each edge as a bond. Um, and you can encode a lot of really interesting information about that molecule. You can encode information about the interactions between groups of atoms, such as what type of bond they share. Um, you can encode information such as the weight of the molecule. And just visually, when you look at a 2D network graph, it looks pretty similar to uh, a sort of a, a molecular uh, drawing, a 2D network drawing of a molecule that you would do in your organic chemistry class. Um, so it translates pretty nicely. Um, and What's nice about graph neural networks and geometric learning is that when you feed in these molecular graphs, which have a lot of information about the chemistry of a molecule, each node's embedding is learning progressively more information about neighboring nodes. Um, so say in your first layer, when you feed in a molecular graph, you take some weighted average of all the nodes uh, that share essentially a bond uh, or share essentially an edge to that node. And you, you take some weighted, weighted average, you transform that information, and then you update the node with the new information. And so when you do this uh, and you stack several layers, what's essentially happening is you're not only learning information about the nodes that, for, for a given node, you're not just learning information about the nodes you share information with or you share a bond with, but you're learning information about second degree neighbors or third degree neighbors. And so this concept is known as a sort of the K-hop neighborhood of a, of a molecular graph. And so some previous work actually started to begin to use graph neural networks for categorizing smells. Um, and this is work done by the previously done by the olfaction team at Google Brain, uh, which they recently spun out into a company. And uh, this work was actually in science, published in science like two days ago. Um, and essentially what they did is they took a molecule, they, they, they take these molecules, they featureize them as a molecular graph and they embed in interesting information about the molecules into the nodes and edges. Um, and they tried to use a graph neural network to learn a meaningful representation or embedding of the graph that you can then sort of average over and sort of sum into a single vector that you pass into a feed forward network and then try to predict different descriptors of how that molecule should smell. Um, say, is that molecule citrusy? Is it creamy? Is it vanilla? Is it beefy? Um, and the reason why you use these descriptors is a lot of the data sets for this problem are collected from large fragrance databases where essentially fragrant, like professional, I, I think the way to put it is just like you have wine connoisseurs, uh, there's professional noses that are trained to essentially smell these molecules and ha have repeated trials uh, across these molecules and create large catalogs of sort of individual organic compounds and sort of their smell profiles um, for say someone who's a, a perfumer to then mix those molecules in some interesting way to create a new fragrance. Um, but this works pretty well for creating some, using some reasonably high quality training data for this problem. Um, and so what they did with this uh, uh, that was published in the last two days was they essentially uh, used this model and then they, they ran a large human trial on 400 new molecules um, across these different odorant descriptors. And they showed that on average across these 400 different molecules, um, the mean uh, essentially the prediction from a model for the for essentially the odor profiles of each of the molecules is better than the mean uh, of sort of odor profile from human ratings. Um, and this is after training this large trial of around 55 different participants to sort of essentially be like, uh, essentially train them on the different smells and have them smell each smell individually and have that to refer to as they're smelling each of the molecules. Um, so essentially the notion being that the model was equivalent to a human nose um, is the is sort of the big picture argument here. Um, and so when we looked at this work, it was really exciting to see it being done. But uh, the question that sort of I had and Kevin had, um, my, one of my mentors was, was essentially, can we learn the fundamental biology behind how this actually happens? Um, like previous work with the graph neural networks, they take the molecules and they directly try to match them to their, their, their odor profiles or their, their percepts or descriptors. Um, but they don't really make much of an effort to understand 
which olfactory receptors they activate, um, mostly because the data is very noisy and it's a very tough problem, uh, but sort of we wanted to give it a stab. So um, essentially we started looking at previous work that was matching odorants to their olfactory receptors experimentally in the wet lab. And we saw a paper from Sri Kosari's group at UCLA, who's now a, the founder of a company, I think like 10 minutes away called Octan, um, and where they essentially built this large multiplexed assay where sort of each row is a novel olfactory receptor and each column is a novel odorant. Um, and so they create this large, uh, large scale display. They test dozens of olfactory receptors against over a hundred molecules. Um, and then they use a, a pre-trained variational autoencoder from uh, previous work to basically generate embeddings for the molecules and show that uh, there's essentially clustering for all the molecules when you sort of do dimensionality reduction down to their principal components. Um, so this is very cool. Um, admittedly, it wasn't like a lot of data, but it was still like one of the first sort of stabs at building a, a, a olfactory receptor ligand binding multiplex sort of assay that could get us experimental data. Um, and so we started to include some of it in our own data sets. Um, on the computational side, there's um, work from a lab, I believe at UC Riverside, that essentially tried to match olfactory receptors to odorants computationally, where they take in a molecule, um, they get its uh, sort of physiochemical descriptors, such as the weight of the molecule, um, the information about functional groups, and they load these chemical features and train a support vector machine to sort of differentiate for each olfactory receptor whether that compound is active or not. Basically meaning, does it bind to that olfactory receptor or does it not? And they do this for every single olfactory receptor. So they train an individual classifier. And from there, they use these models to predict for each olfactory receptor, which what subset of 450,000 different molecules or chemicals bind to those olfactory receptors. And from here, with that large database of molecules and their predicted olfactory receptors, where say I have molecule I, it has these features that relate to its structure, and it, so, and it binds to say olfactory receptor 155 and say 132, as an example, say as an example, you essentially feed in those predict the predicted olfactory receptors, you feed in the chemical information, and then you start to train support vector machines to predict what that molecule smells like. Um, and again, here they're training an individual support vector machine for each uh, odor descriptor. Um, and so this was pretty interesting. It was, I think the first work that we saw that was actually doing this sort of multi-step process of, okay, let's learn the molecule structure, but let's also learn information about which olfactory receptors interact with that molecule and then use that to predict scent. Um, but there were still some limitations here. One thing being that each olfactory receptor is an individual classifier, and the molecule and the models aren't taking anything about each olfactory receptor sequence. Um, and as I mentioned previously, often sequence variation at the olfactory receptor level can cause very, very different um, smells. Um, and so we wanted to try and go ahead and build a model that would be more sensitive to that. And so in sort of thinking about this problem, we thought about what was the dream data set that we'd want to, to solve this problem. Um, the problem the what we would want is we would want sort of this unique pairs uh, or, or triplets of molecules, the olfactory receptors they activate, and their underlying odors. Um, and so we'd want diverse molecule olfactory receptor pairs and then connecting connect those molecules to their odors. Um, and so when we went out to go and find the data to try and do this, what we essentially found is that there is no data with o to do this uh, <laughs> essentially. And um, what 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 essentially, this means is that we found a lot of data um, collected by another paper that works on olfactory receptor ligand binding uh, around 700 or 731 molecules. And then we collect we collected a bunch of data from essentially uh, large, these large fragrance databases like Good Sense and Leffingwell. And so we had around 5,800 molecules there. And we went and said, okay, let's see if there's any identical molecules um, between the two sets, is there like any molecules that have say 100% structural similarity uh, when you compare it, when you compare their molecules? Um, and as you can see here, it's pretty sparse. There's not many. There's maybe some yellow you can see, like some some sparse traces of yellow, but in general, there's not a lot of overlap um, in molecules where you have information about olfactory receptors and you have information about um, their underlying smells. Uh, 
Um, and so we said, okay, what can we do anyway? Okay, these problems are disjoint, so we'd have to model them separately, but what, what, can, we, what can we do? Well, the first thing we can do is we can create data sets like the brain team did from perfumery materials. So there are these large fragrance databases of, uh, say, like Good Sense and Leffingwell that have individual molecules, and they're essentially they're they're all they're odorant descriptors. Um, say, for example, if you take vanillin, um, you'll get sort of a, which is a very vanilla-like smelling molecule, a really pleasant molecule. Um, you'll, you'll get, for example, odor ratings as it being sweet, as it's smelling like vanilla, as it having a creamy sort of chocolatey smell. Um, and these reviews are sort of constructed from repeated ratings from fragrance experts. Um, but there are still a lot of problems. So when we went ahead, we collected this data set from the, these, these databases and we, what we were left with was this very imbalanced multitask problem basically where you have essentially a couple of labels that have a lot of molecules, essentially, for example, something like uh, fruity will have, a lot of mole will have a lot of molecules that essentially are, are classified as being fruity. But some of these more, uh, I guess, very sort of exotic descriptors, like uh, a molecule being uh, smelled as bready, as radish, or as orange flower, which I'm, I'm not really sure what orange flower is supposed to smell like, but um, <laughs> you, you'll find that there's a, a very small amount of molecules that actually um, fit those descriptors. And what makes this hard is a large majority of the ground truth descriptors or tasks in our data set have very few molecules that smell like those tasks. Um, and so we had to do some filtering and we, we ended up basically condensing the data set down to around 150 descriptors that have at least 30 molecules that are positive labels for those tasks. Um, so we collected essentially a multi-task data set for this. So once we, we went ahead and did that and we started looking at, okay, can we now collect data about olfactory receptors and which odorants they bind to? Um, and we came across this paper from a couple uh, from around, I think, May or April um, in iClear, where they essentially created a really nice data set of essentially olfactory receptor molecule pairs by scraping across dozens of different um, uh, works of literature, um, across biological journals, across neuroscience journals. And um, so in total, they collected around um, 46,000 olfactory receptor molecule pairs, which we parsed. Out of that, you have essentially 1,237 unique sequences for the receptors. Um, and we, we, we actually were able to collect in this data set, have data from not only humans, but we had olfactory receptors from mice, we had olfactory receptors from primates. Um, and so that was really interesting. Um, but again, there still were problems here. One of the biggest problems was it was still very imbalanced. Um, only about 6% of the data is uh, agonist, which basically means that it, um, or, or it, bind, it essentially binds and activates that olfactory receptor. Uh, so it's almost a one to 16 ratio of positives to negatives. Uh, the other problem we had was that the data uh, that was collected in the wet lab was a very imbalanced, varying quality. Um, so most of the data is coming from these primary screens. And what these primary screens are doing is they're basically injecting um, into an individual cell. They're injecting at one concentration a molecule and they're only doing it once. So there are no replicates. Um, there was some data with secondary screens where they do essentially inject it at multiple different concentrations, the molecules, and see if they bind. But what we really want, what would be like nice ground truth data would be more dose responses where they're not only capturing a molecule at different concentrations, but they're also testing it many different times to see if it like if there's replicates, if it hold, if it's consistently binding. Um, and there's not some sort of one-off false positive, basically. Um, but even here, a small subset of the data set was coming from that dose response data. So we had to get kind of creative with how we could learn from this data. And so as a start, what we did is we aimed to go and replicate essentially the, 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 the brain team work, uh, uh, the whole faction work of given a molecule, can we predict which subset of these 152 odor descriptors it matches? So we would take these molecules, embed them as a molecular graph, pass them through a stack of graph, graph convolutional network layers, uh, do some weighted sum operation to get it down to a single vector, pass that through a feed forward network, and then sort of train it on this multitask classification task. Um, and so that was our first step of basically trying to reproduce that task. Um, from there, we said, okay, uh, we've, we've gone and done that. Like that's one baseline. Now let's, what if we, as a very simple task, before we even start to learn information about proteins, uh, 
let's do exactly what that paper did with the support vector machines and treat each olfactory receptor as a unique task. Um, and sort of you have some subset of molecules for which you have some subset of olfactory receptors. And so you'll essentially mask the loss where you're only taking the loss on the olfactory receptors for which you have data. Um, and so we, the, most of the code was the same, except for obviously evaluating the model. Uh, and here we got pretty bad results, essentially, where if we just treat olfactory receptors as a multitask problem uh, for varying reasons, like data quality issues, uh, like sequence variation, because this data set has a lot of mutants of the same olfactory receptor, which can produce, uh, which can change whether or not that molecule binds to it. Um, there's a lot of mixed noise that makes it very hard to just learn this task as a multitask problem. And so we went back to the drawing board and sort of thought about what are interesting inductive biases that are going on at the biological level here that we can use for modeling this task of whether an odorant molecule binds to an olfactory receptor. And sort of what we thought about was, first of all, first of all when you look at a receptor odorant complex, you'd ideally want a model to learn information about not only the molecular structure like we were doing so far, but also learn information about the protein structure as necessary. Um, so we started thinking about how could we try to find ways to embed that. And on the other hand, we had this idea of locality where um, certain residues in the learned protein representation are much more key in the interaction with the molecule. And so how do we train a model that learns to prioritize the specific residues in a protein when making a prediction. Um, and to show even more evidence for this, this is taking a look at that first crystallized structure. They ran a bunch of simulations and they tried to look at which residues made contact with which atoms. And you can see here that there's really only a subset of eight residues that are making any sort of contact in these sort of molecular dynamic simulations with atoms in the propionate molecule. Um, and so there's clearly, you, you clearly, for example, if you're learning our representation, don't wanna just average over all the information you learn for each residue in a protein. You, you want to find some way to prioritize certain residues that you think are gonna be key in whether or not that molecule binds and activates it. And so here we took inspiration from sort of the rise of protein language models. Um, so several teams, there's teams at Salesforce, teams at Facebook Research um, that have trained these huge protein language models that are up to say 15 billion parameters. And they're trained on exactly the same task as what folks in natural language modeling have been doing, a uh, mass language modeling, where you input a protein, you mass certain residues or amino acids, and you train the model to essentially recover the corrupted sequence. Um, and if you do this, essentially what, what the work they've done over the past couple of years has found is if you do this well enough on large enough data sets uh, on, and with large enough models, these models can start to reconstruct, not only reconstruct the sequence as well, but in the process, implicitly capture information about a protein structure. So this is a paper from a couple of years ago where they did this with, I think at the time, a 650 million parameter model from FAIR. And they showed that this model, when you take a look at its attention weights, um, you can literally use those attention weights to see that it recovers information about contacts at the 3D structural level, where, for example, each row and each column um, are essentially unique uh, residues. And if you essentially, essentially what you're trying to predict is do does residue I and residue J essentially make contact? And these models became very good at reconstructing these contact maps. And more recently in science, the FAIR team published a paper where they were even able to use this model to do structure prediction pretty well and also incredibly fast. Um, and so we wanted to try and see if we could use these protein language models as another backbone for our model. Um, and so why use attention um, at all? I, I think our, our idea was that using a, the attention mechanism can kind of capture the locality of molecular interactions that happen between a unique receptor and a unique molecule. Um, if you have two different modalities, you can do this really interesting thing called cross-attention, where instead of doing self-attention, where you're computing queries, keys, and values across the same modality and uh, doing attention off of that, you can actually feed in two modalities, where one modality is mapped to where key and value matrices, and one is mapped to a query matrices. And you can essentially what the end goal you get is you get these attention scores where for each residue and for each molecule, you're getting some weighing of how much to prioritize that residue's embedding information or how much to prioritize that molecule's embedding information. And so we use this in our sort of architecture for doing, for matching receptors to odorants, where 
essentially first what we do is we take the odorant, we pass it through the same graph convolutional network that we used before. And what we get as an output is this 2D tensor where each, you can think of each column as being an atom and each row as being essentially the number of embedding dimensions. And you can do the same with the Facebook model where you feed in your olfactory receptor and you get some 2D embedding where for each residue you have say 1,020, 1,280 dimensions uh, for your embedding dimension. And we feed this into a set of cross attention blocks to essentially get a weighed average for say that for each atom, how much, are, how much should we prioritize that atom in our final embedding for that atom, for that molecule? And same thing for residues where the cross attention block will tell us for each residue, how much should we prioritize that? And so we get these output vectors that are say one by number of residues or one by number of atoms. And all we are doing is we're doing essentially a, ma a matrix multiplication operation on what's directly the output of our, our backbone, our, our graph models and our protein language models to get what's essentially our final vector embedding um, that's just essentially the, 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 the number of dimensions for each of them. And we concatenate the two and then feed that into a feed forward network, the same as before, to then predict whether or not that olfactory receptor binds to that ligand. And in doing this, we, we got, I, I think, arguably some pretty exciting results where when we try to progressively add more and more information about a protein sequence, and hopefully it's structured through the protein language models, these models get better and better and better at matching whether a unique odorant molecule binds to a unique receptor. Um, so the first result in the first row is essentially our multitask graph neural network, which wasn't that great. As a very simple first idea, before we even went and tried the cross-attention idea, we said, let's just use the ESM in uh, these protein language models, zero shot, and generate essentially a fixed length vector output where we just average over all the residues and get sort of some output that's say like one by number of dimensions. And all we do, all we did is we would concatenate that to our molecule embedding and feed that into a model to predict whether or not the protein and the molecule bind. And that alone helped quite a bit. So then we got pretty excited and we said, okay, can we start to try to use our model and try this cross attention idea and does that help even more? And as a first test, what we did is we it reinitialized the protein language model to have sort of empty weights uh, or, or random, randomly initialized weights because we wanted to see how much sort of the attention even on the molecular features that are learned by the graph model help and whether or not attention is able to discount in this case, the protein embeddings, which are essentially noise. And even in doing that, that, that helped even more than using the, the original embedding of the molecule and the original embedding of the protein. Um, so we had the signal to basically say that uh, the cross attention module works, regardless of if the information about the protein is garbage. Um, and why that's important is oftentimes because we don't have a lot of structural information about these olfactory receptors. In some cases, what comes out of these models may be, I mean, rubbish, because uh, we, we don't, we, we have no way of verifying whether that's the actual structure or whether the embeddings capture a lot of meaningful structural information. And so in some cases, we want the model to sort of deprioritize information about the protein and sort of try to maximize information about the molecules and making a prediction. And then as our final sort of model, what we did is we said, okay, let's now use the per residue protein language model embedding, and let's do the full cross attention and see if that helps even more. And we sort of saw better results doing that. Um, and so now what we said is, okay, we have a reasonably good receptor protein ligand model where our receptor sort of olfactory receptor odorant model uh, can we essentially use these predictions just like that original paper with the support vector machine to generate sort of features? So, so we would say, okay, we have 400 olfactory receptors. Let's essentially feed in each of those sequences and generate uh, for all of the model for all the molecules that we have information about their smells, but no information about which olfactory receptors they interact with. Let's generate predictions. So you can imagine for each molecule, you will basically get this one by 400 vector. That is essentially uh, each essentially olfactory receptor's prediction, so a vector of zeros and ones, and we would concatenate that that to our essentially our original molecule embedding of the sort of the single vector embedding output, concatenate the two, pass that through a feed forward network, and then try and get the model to predict uh, which subset of the 152 odor descriptors that molecule smells like. And here we saw some interesting results where first. For the first result is sort of reproducing the, the original graph convolutional network of treating it as a multitask problem. 
The second result is feeding in the purely the olfactory receptor features where we, for these molecules, we have no sort of ground truth knowledge about what they're, what receptors they're going to bind to. Um, and you can see that there's pretty, pretty reasonable imp improvement on our test set um, by just, by just feeding in this one by 400 vector of olfactory receptor activations. And the third idea we said, oh, is, are there some, is there some mutual information in training a model on both the olfactory receptor task and the scent task jointly, um, and then testing it on the test set. So we tried that as well. And we said that that helped, but it didn't help as much as using the protein ligand model zero shot and feeding in those features into the model. And so now we, we, we basically said towards the end of the internship, basically, we have a model that is reasonably good at matching receptors to, to ligands um, or to odorant molecules. Um, can we now essentially go and look at molecules where we have not only their structure, but we also have information about which odors they sort of emit um, and go and predict sort of information about which olfactory receptors they activate and see if there's unique patterns. Um, essentially trying to go and answer this original question I probed of uh, combinatorial coding. For example, are there specific olfactory receptors that code for vanilla smelling molecules? Even more boldly, are there specific olfactory receptors that code for a, a molecule being perceived as pleasant? Um, and while we were starting to do this, uh, one of my mentors, Judith, came across this really interesting paper that she shared where essentially one of the biggest criticisms of using an approach like this is the idea that, oh, odor perception isn't universal across cultures. Um, and it's a very reasonable argument. For example, someone who is more familiar with a certain smell will consider that from a different culture, will consider that smell differently than someone who's maybe not being exposed to that smell as much from a different part of the world um, and basically rank it very differently. And so this paper basically aimed to question, you sort of are definitively try and question that um, and basically say, if we collect 55 participants from across the world and essentially ask them to smell eight different molecules with very different ranges of some being incredibly un pleasant, sulfuric, um, and some being very pleasant and vanilla-like, is there sort of a universal sense of pleasantness and thereby maybe even odor perception? And so the key result of this paper was basically that you have these molecules, you, you, you essentially can sample across very different ethnic groups, across Thai groups, across uh, unique tribes, of, uh, of First Nations individuals, across Mexican individuals, and basically people across the world and essentially try and essentially average across all of the groups uh, where essentially they're asked to rank these eight molecules from most pleasant to least pleasant. Um, so one being most pleasant, 10 being least pleasant. And the most exciting thing here is when you average across all these different people from very different sort of backgrounds, you, you start to get sort of a consistent ranking of pleasantness across cultures. Um, and the goal of this paper was basically to argue maybe there is a sense of odor perception that it is universal across cultures. And there's not as much variation um, as we thought there was originally. And so in motivated by this, we first started to essentially use these models on a subset of olfactory receptors for which we had a lot, of, for which the model had seen a lot. Essentially, we, we took the 400 olfactory receptor sequences that were most seen in the, our training data set. And we basically took a group of molecules that we knew from these fragrance databases were considered to smell as vanilla and creamy. And we said, okay, let's use this model to zero shot, make predictions about which olfactory receptors get activated. And we got some pretty exciting results where you can consistently see that certain receptors where each receptor is sort of a column seem to be predicted by the model as being activated. Um, and so that sort of got us very excited where oh, maybe we can, this can start to be, uh, as this model gets better and better, a tool for probing unique olfactory receptors and how they code for unique smells, which is the grand vision of, I think, olfaction and like a, a, long, a long time dream of the community. Um, and so we said, okay, let's try the even harder problem of linking olfactory receptors to pleasantness. And we said, okay, let's take the aid molecules from that sort of study that they profiled across 55 participants. And let's see, uh, let, let's go ask like a crazy question. Let's see if there's olfactory receptors that consistently code for pleasantness um, as like a very fun side experiment. Um, and here we saw that there wasn't a lot of clear signal here. I, I mean, as expected, um, you, 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 you don't really see consistently like olfactory receptors that get activated for pleasant molecules versus unpleasant molecules. 
um, at least with the model that we've trained so far. Um, and so that was sort of still an open question. Uh, we then tried a larger, essentially, uh, subset of molecules, around 20 molecules, where 10 of those molecules were consistently known to be pleasant from these human, human rankings, and some were considered universally unpleasant from these rankings. And we saw here that still there wasn't a lot of good signal about whether certain olfactory receptors differentiate from unpleasant to pleasant molecules. But one interesting thing we did see is that there seemed to be less receptors for some reason in our, molecule, our model getting predicted for all the samples that are unpleasant. Um, this could be for a number of reasons. It might be that our training data set is fairly skewed towards being towards having pleasant molecules. Um, and, and so that's something we're still looking to investigate and try and understand. And so sort of some overall takeaways of this work um, is first of all, combinatorial, understanding combinatorial coding of all faction is incredibly complex. Um, I think a large part of this problem being really hard is it's a massive data problem. Um, trying and running these large multiplexed assays for uh, odor molecules binding to olfactory receptors are, are very hard to do. They're hard to replicate. Um, and so it's very hard to say build a drink data set where you profile thousands of molecules across all 400 olfactory receptors. Um, and so there's still a lot of work just on the experimental side from wet lab biology to help us get there. Um, but on the bright side, what we do see is that you can, as, as you incorporate more inductive biases from protein ligand complexes, you can start to build a model that can match odor and molecules to their olfactory receptors, um, which I think is exciting because we know these experimental techniques are really, really hard to run. Um, and so an exciting downstream use of this model is in probing which olfactory, which if we want to study specific olfactory receptors, using this model to find molecules across huge databases that are predicted to bind to that olfactory receptor and then validating them in the wet lab. Um, and again, zeroing in on the end goal, I, I think our, our end goal was to essentially the goal of this work is to try and make a first probe towards building a, a, a deep learning based end to end map of this idea of olfactory information flow. Um, and so showing that in learning information about the biology, about the receptors, we can start to get better at understanding the combinatorial codable faction. And so in terms of next steps, very briefly, um, so, some work that I think could be great next steps for us are starting to integrate more pre-trained chemical models. So I spent quite a bit of time talking about how pre-trained protein-based models um, have been shown to be incredibly strong at various tasks like and are being used broadly in protein engineering and protein structure prediction um, in designing new antibodies. Um, I think the same can be said for molecules. There's a lot of really impressive work on building pre-trained chemical language models um, and chemical graph language uh, graph transformers. Um, one immediate next step as well is seeing if the molecule embeddings that are learned from this model can help us map unique hierarchies of smell. So I think at the start of the slide, I showed this idea of an odor latent map that was essentially using the embeddings from the Google Brain model. Um, one thing that we'd be really interested in showing is, can we see that the model can cluster unique odor families, um, say, of very pleasant molecules differently than very unpleasant molecules, or very unique subsets of odor profiles as differently than other odor profiles. Um, another interesting thing more on the structural biology, and that I'm personally very excited to try, is uh, using the learned attention weights from this model where you essentially have each row being a, an atom in a molecule and each column being a residue in a protein, can we see that, that the model is able to capture lo the locality of protein ligand binding? Um, one idea is, can we reproduce the contact maps that people have shown experimentally in cryo-EM structures of olfactory receptors bound to molecules in silico with our model? Um, and as a final step, uh, we use protein language models, but perhaps structure prediction models are good enough to begin using the structure-based embeddings directly instead of the sequence-based directions uh, embeddings. And yeah, I, I'd like to thank my mentors, Judith and Kevin, for sort of, first of all, inviting me into the world of olfaction um, and just being a great group of people to work with. I've learned a lot about machine learning and biology from Kevin. I've basically gotten a crash course on olfaction from Judith. Um, and so it's been a really fun project. I'd also like to acknowledge Hattie Chung from the Broad Institute, actually, uh, who's, a, who's a postdoc at the Broad, um, for actually sort of uh, taking the time to talk to me early on and sort of explain a lot of the biology behind olfactory receptors. 
I'd like to thank uh, some of the, the lead author of sort of the other paper that created the large scale database for olfactory receptor ligand binding, Matage. And I'd also like to broadly thank the MSR New England lab for being just an incredible place with researchers from very diverse backgrounds that I'm constantly inspired by and the undergrad program for making this internship possible. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sion.